promoted or provoked uh, to continue our own journey around improvement science and continuous improvement and just the whole notion of getting better. I wanted to say as context for Pat Greco, and I'm just absolutely over the moon that she's here with us, that while uh, working at SUNY System and looking at 64 independent campuses that did not have the propensity on any given day to maybe work together, um, sometimes I think collaboration is not a natural act. It's an acquired skill. And uh, we were talking about how we could promote more interaction and collective impact and outcomes that matter across the system. And we were always surrounded, uh, Jason Lane knows this, by a lot of young people who just have no filter. And we were talking about, you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and how can we instill this kind of culture at SUNY and what are we gonna say about it? And somebody, probably someone under 21 said, you should just call this systemness, which was not on Wikipedia at the time. And of course, I'm very proud to say it is now on Wikipedia. And nobody has kicked us out because we keep saying the whole has to be greater than the sum of the parts. We have to figure out how to work together and particularly how to work together to take our improvements to scale. That is Pat Greco's wheelhouse. This is an extraordinary leader who, like all of us, started somewhere else, happens to be that she had an industry uh, tenure in her background, happened to be GE Medical in, in Milwaukee. She was a curriculum director uh, twice over or three times over superintendent. You had a lot of training in that regard. But when she got to this lovely district just outside the city of Milwaukee called Menominee Falls, as that superintendent, she was able to put all of her learning together and particularly how important it is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and if you can't scale an improvement, you're not really going to be able to change the practice or transform the institution. Might be a school district, might be a university. We're learning, it probably will be a hospital and it certainly started on the industry on the industry floor. So Pat is a woman of many honors and distinctions. Thank goodness your work has been recognized because this kind of leadership where you're able to take continuous improvement to scale in a school district has to be heralded as something we all have to pay attention to. So Pat now advises hospitals, the Baldridge Award, uh, corporate America, policy and local government, and brings to us today a message about the systemness of continuous improvement that I think is uh, really what collectively we can do to bring this message to our school districts and our universities and our communities. So it is with an immense deal of respect and pride that we got Pat Greco to come here today and talk to us. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Pat Greco. It's an honor to be here at when Nancy called saying, Pat, would you be happy to come on a Saturday afternoon and a beautiful fall day to Albany, New York? Of course I said yes. Um, as I also realize I am the only thing between you and whatever your rest of your evening is going to be. So hopefully you is able to be a little bit helpful to you as you're thinking about your role as a leader, your role in education, and your role in you know, that future endeavor. We started the afternoon, um, Amani and Betty were talking about hard conversations and tilling the soil. Then we moved into a conversation around bright spots and tackling the wicked challenges. We talked about blame and vulnerability and how do we actually view the world. As a leader, and I was talking to Nancy about this, I've served in public education in a variety of 
examples from rural to urban to suburban, mostly in the state of Wisconsin, but now I, know I work coast to coast. As, as we think about what we're learning as a profession, I've learned a lot from out of industry. I've learned from industry leaders, I've learned from healthcare, which are wickedly complex systems that require high skill and they're people dependent. I've learned a lot about how systems operate and then how do we provide quality at scale in wickedly complicated systems and not blame people for outcomes and learn from what we're seeing within the system and opening up that conversation so that we can spread that learning. It's easy to say, and when we think about it, the concepts are complicated. It's hard to hardwire in human systems at scale. And how do we break down the fear and the vulnerability and actually learn together as a profession? So as we think about a bit of time, and I probably have 20 slides, I'm going to talk to them in, a, in the story of what I've learned most over the course of improving outcomes for children and for adults. I want you to think about how do you define an improving culture? at scale across an organization. I want you to think about are you improving what matters most within, within the system, within the classroom, within the buildings, and how are you having that conversation? How can we learn from our work and how can we scale what we learn? And how do we build capacity for improvement for others? So when we're onboarding 23-year-old teachers or brand new leaders within wickedly complicated systems, how do we ease that so that they're not bumping into the same things we've already learned as a system? How do we create protocols around what matters most without getting lost in the protocol but staying tied to the why behind it? So, when we think about the background, we want to spend a little bit of time introducing myself. Nancy shared a little bit. I started out as a special education and literacy teacher. I've had all of the roles within education, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, superintendent. I have two master's degrees and a PhD from Wisconsin. In research one institutions, Everything that I've learned from about improvement science has come from out of industry, predominantly healthcare. Predominantly healthcare. So when we think about what we can learn from others, one of the things that I wish we would lift the conversation on is how do we learn how systems improve at scale and make it stick? We don't operate that way within our field. If we were in charge of deciding the attributes of high blood pressure, we would have all of our teachers identify what high blood pressure the definition of it would be and the measures to test it. And then we would blame them if something went wrong. So, and I'm saying that a little bit facetiously, but that really is how our profession works. And that's part of where my thinking has shifted the most. Where I started in Menominee Falls, and as Nancy indicated, as a leader, a leader in a variety of different settings, Menominee Falls was identified by Milwaukee Magazine as being a high-spending, underperforming school district in the state of Wisconsin. The, one of the highest-spending, underperforming school systems in the state of Wisconsin. We, had, we were on our second notice with no child left behind. We had seven times the suspension rate of the state, and that included Milwaukee Public Schools. And we were on our second notice as I was being hired as superintendent to say your children would be better served going someplace else. Hi, my name's Pat. I'm your new superintendent. 
As we think about an improving system versus an improvement project, I know we don't have a lot of time. I want you to, with an elbow partner, talk about the difference between an improvement project and an improving system. Just two minutes. With no high school diploma, they are the highest likelihood of living and working within 10 miles of where they're born, multiple service sector jobs, and in poverty. So we recreate the communities that we serve. When they have some, when they have a high school diploma, it drops. When they have some education at any level, it can be a three month certification in a skilled trade, it drops again. And the, and the biggest legacy difference maker is a bachelor's degree on up. We think about our students' pathways, our collective why. We know we want children to successfully transition to the workforce. Continued education, military service, our pain point is they can also transition to legacy poverty, incarceration, and death. So the pathways that are our outcomes are really the whys behind our collective improvement. And we know that in order to be successful, we have to develop a strong arm of collective power among leaders. Leadership is a behavior, not a job title. Leadership exists at every level within the organization. Your facilities team members, your food service workers. And there are select parts of your behaviors and actions, your processes, that define how you execute. Your execution is not what you say your strategy is, it's what you do. What you actually do is your strategy. 
And you either accelerate performance, or as we heard earlier, our systems get the outcomes because of the way we currently execute. So when we think about organizational improvement, and, and earlier you heard about the six principles of improvement science, what I've learned also is there a set of nine principles. You have the slide deck available to you. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but it builds the backbone for an improving organization that improvement projects nest within. How do we build a commitment to excellence among all employees, support staff and certified staff? Most school districts don't provide any development for their support staff, none. They will give them a job title, a key, and a job responsibility, and three year, 30 years later, maybe a watch or a bell. And that's half of your organization. Half of your organization is not certified teachers. How do you build a system of measuring the important things? How do you build leadership at every level of the organization? How do you recognize and reward success among your staff members? I affectionately call those the heart of an improving organization, and then the backbone is evidence-based leadership. It's a combination of developing the skills of improvement and understanding the science behind it and building a culture of improvement and the intersection there is what creates an improving organization. You've heard the adage, the culture will eat strategy for lunch. You cannot have an improving organization in a caustic culture. Children will not thrive and adults will not stay. So, when we talk about evidence-based leadership, and I apologize because the distance is so great, typically, most educational organizations will start over here. What programs, what technology, what accelerators matter? And when they don't change outcomes, three to five years later, they'll be talking about what program, what technology, what system can we put in place to change outcomes. Evidence-based leadership starts on the left-hand side. What matters most? How do we measure what we value as a community? The attributes that we want for student learning. The attributes that we want for employee success. How do we develop our people so they can be successful at those? How do we create a set of always actions so we, ex we execute consistently at scale across the organization? And then how do we actually use a set of reflections so that people say, I am following and honoring the commitments that we've made as a team? Then our improvement system can take hold then we can learn from one another and we can learn to accelerate that learning so that we can pick things that will accelerate outcomes that will actually affect change. Every organization has individual people who are strong practitioners, you among them. Every organization has leaders who are trying to shift systems. You have some isolated improvement projects taking hold. Part of the challenge is, is without an aligned system that improvement projects can hang on to, leaders change, people don't follow through, you're actually shifting energy, but you're not actually improving at scale. originally said organizations with 500 people in them make 4 million decisions a day. Part of the focus of an improving system is are they aligned? Are they heading in the same direction? 
Are they based on those same core principles? Do we have a set of processes that we agree to? Improvement, How do, what's the definition of an improving culture? The elimination of unnecessary hassle. For who? The elimination of unnecessary hassle. For whom? Say it out loud. Everyone. Staff, students, parents, the community. Improvement of outcomes that are defined and problems are solved. Not creating a series of workarounds, but actually removing the barriers so that we're not bumping up against those same problems again. You heard earlier about how is the system experienced. So how are we actually resolving the problems that we know that are, that are existing and improving the outcomes at scale? And being honest about those hassles so that we can actually improve the processes that are creating them. We have changed outcomes at every level of the organization by really for the first three years we stopped buying stuff. We invested the dollars in the brain power of the people on support staff side and certified staff side. We invested in learning about how to improve. We invested in creating standards of service to one another. The behavior, what it means to be an excellent team member, and an excellent educator as a whole, providing service to the community that we serve. We have changed the trajectory of kids' lives, and the other piece that I want to share with you is a story of, of South Louisiana Community College. In post-retirement, I now have the good fortune of working with Studer Education. We serve organizations coast to coast. We work with government agencies, we work with higher education agencies, and we work with school systems that are committed to improving at scale. So when we think about the outcomes, this is a graduating class of nurses from South Louisiana Community College where 100% of their students passed the boards. 100%. In demographics that wouldn't typically produce those results. These are their outcomes regarding enrollment, regarding completion rates, so when we think about achieving and defining results, the leadership has to deal with both the culture and the strategy in order to improve organizational outcomes. Easy to say and the hardest work you do. I'm going to start a little bit on culture. Gerstner will say not tending to a toxic culture is fatal. Fixing culture is the most critical and most difficult part of transformation. You heard earlier about a culture of nice. It's one of the hard parts in education is when you're bumping up against hard conversations, people will walk away as opposed to staying in the middle of a hard conversation. Rather than saying, I don't agree, or we don't treat people that way here. And silence is complicit. Learning how to have hard conversations without breaking relationships is part of that learning journey. Onboarding people around your standards of excellence for service and team excellence is part of the obligation of the organization. The problems, when we talk about barriers within the system, the people closest to the work see 100% of the barriers. The people closest to that job responsibility. Part of the challenge is the leaders don't, they see about 4% of the complexity of the work in the organization. And without having the real conversations, they can't get those barriers out of the way. 
So when you think about the how, how do you actually learn where the barriers are? Leader rounding is one of the strategies that builds that sense of culture. Meeting with every staff member a couple of times a year, what's going well? What's a barrier you're experiencing? Do you have the resources that you need to do your job effectively? And who's been particularly helpful to you so we can manage them up and say thank you on your behalf? It's getting to that heartbeat of really what's happening within the organization. This is a focus group. We have the same conversations with our students. So we talk about with the kids, what's going well? What's a barrier that you're experiencing? When school was successful for you, what were we doing differently? With the staff members that you are having success with, what are they doing with you? I had a focus group with a group of kids on Monday of last week. These are kids who have traditionally performed very poorly in school. They said noon hour was awful. You take kids with high anxiety and then you say, let's go to lunch. Right? So having those real conversations with the kids will unveil what barriers they're experiencing and you'd be shocked at how simple the strategies are. Most of the improvements aren't complicated. Feedback is a key to understanding your culture. So asking staff a couple times a year, getting families to sh share what their experience is, student feedback, and then the focus groups are key. Leader rounding with every staff member at every part of the organization. Third shift, facility workers. Who meets with them? They are the face of your organization, and they are the ones that bump up against the entire community. Most of the people that your community bumps up against are not certified staff members. When we think about people first, service then everything, and strategy is only as good as your execution. If 50% of your leadership is following through with improvement processes differently, your strategy is 50% implementation. That's where we struggle as a field. And as you heard earlier, part of the challenge is, are we improving what matters most? Public policy has placed measurement in a fear-driven view of education. I'm going to share an analogy again, a little bit on healthcare. When you think of, about a baby born in crisis, they receive an APRAP score. For those of you who are parents, a perfect APGAR score is a 10. It means a child is born healthy and thriving. When a child is struggling at birth, they are placed in the neonatal intensive care unit. And they're given the highest skill at birth for children living in crisis. Three years later, those children are going to bump into the school system. Right? Part of the challenge is that same child will be viewed as a child at risk and we view the people at blame. We don't shift our learning from healthcare as an industry to education as an industry with an improvement. So part of what I'd like you to do is not be fearful of measures but view them as the ability to see the current conditions that children have and are living in. When you think about strategy, when we talk about current performance and we talk about having an annual plan and the outcomes and the goals, Tony Bright will talk about the black box. We'll set a goal, and a year later, we'll actually look at what those outcomes are. 
And then hope is the strategy. We hope kids get better. When we think about learning as a system and the model for improvement, we are actually taking a look at where is our current performance and then breaking down that level of performance in 10 to 15 day, 45 day increments to say, what's our plan? After we've implemented that strategy, what are the outcomes and how are we going to shift performance based on what we're saying? Our big aims as an organization were to make sure every student transitioned to college and work prepared, every student and family felt like they belonged, and all students and, and children are engaged, all students and families and staff feel we're a district of choice. The measures were tied to those big aims, and we actually measured them as a system and broke apart the demographics of the data so that we could look at quality, service, safety, and our financial well-being. Our balance scorecard gave us a view of is the system improving. When we took a look at where our current performance is, it really becomes that gap. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And what strategies do we believe are going to get us there? We moved our improvement cycles into 45-day increments. In August, board and full leadership team took a look at where are we performing? How are we doing in comparison to what those big aims are and our core pillars of improvement, the heart of what we want to accomplish? We established a 45-day plan for improvement. And then the plan to study act was at the classroom level, the school level, the division levels, and the system level for improvement. When we looked at those independent cycles, we looked for the bright spots. Off incremental data, which classrooms are learning differently and why. Under what conditions are they shifting? Part of the challenge is when you ask staff members what they're doing differently, they assume everyone else is using the same strategies. So part of the challenge is, is actually getting into those deeper conversations of what strategies have made the biggest difference and why do you think that's so. Tony will share the measures your accountability measures are not improvement measures. They're too small. So when you're thinking about the measures that matter most, in the Plan New Study Act cycle, you're looking for classroom measures. We've been talking about common assessments since the late 80s. Part of the challenge is few have them in and it creates a great difficulty to say, how are we learning together as a field? So when we talk about the measures that matter between the outcomes of college readiness and career readiness and common assessments, quiz data, your unit assessments, that actually is the sweet spot of where your improvement conversations when we set up the Plan New Study Act process, it will look differently by level. In the high school level, they'll typically put it into the student management system. You've got to make the plan and the goals visible to the kids. And then have the, the strategy of what you're going to do, a conversation with the students. Most of us know the high leverage strategies that matter for instructional practices. Based on Hattie's and Marzano's work, the challenge is we don't deploy them and execute them at scale and understand which strategies make the difference for which kids under which conditions. We also rarely ask the kids what's working for them. So we think about creating the plan, 
knowing the do and giving the students the language to explain what strategies matter, and then having conversations with the students on what's working for them and not working for them in 10 to 15 day increments, taking their feedback and shifting our actions. In the weekly meetings of grade level practice, they'll have conversations around what are they seeing shifting? What feedback are they getting from the students that matter most? They'll do improvement boards off of their current data, the root cause, their next set of actions, and their predictions of what will make the biggest difference if they deploy it. And they'll measure off of how did our prediction match with reality? Did those strategies that we said we were going to do actually create the level of change that we intended? And the improvement cycles happen on 10 to 15 day cycles and 45 day cycles at the building level, at the division level, and at the system level. We've changed outcomes. This was a project where students who had never achieved successful outcomes in math within one semester actually demonstrated a 2.8 GPA grade level. And within a semester, they were able to actually re-enter the regular class behavior. It's never happened before. And it was really the feedback from the students on those 10 to 15 day cycles of what strategies were making the biggest difference for them. Here's an example of our facilities team who actually were doing a root cause analysis to save resources so that we could redirect the funds to our kindergarten class sizes and reduce the level of teacher to student ratio based on the savings. The project they did is they determined if they bought mowers that were two blades size larger than what we were currently using, we could reduce our staff time in mowing our lawns from five days to three and shift our temporary workers that we no longer needed to employ and shift those resources back to the classroom. The level of projects that happened on the support staff side and the certified staff side were high. Our healthcare work team works with our facilities team during the highest point of the flu season to determine where student absences are. And they'll send the teams to the elementary schools to do deep cleaning where flu season is popping. And they're doing it based on the data that they're seeing within the buildings. We have employee injuries, this number two, and our food service workers. Those were our highest injury rates. We brought in a team of health care workers from our local hospital, occupational therapists, who came in and taught appropriate lifting. And we retaught our special education aides how to de-escalate and avoid getting into holds as your first response. Because when people go into holding as the first response, injuries are high. We went from half a million dollars down to $12,970 in a year. And then we received a dividend from our health insurance provider of $250,000 because we were outperforming the norm. The delta was three quarters of a million dollars every year. So when we talk about improvement, we're not talking about just projects. It's how do you scale what you're learning? How do you make it stick? How when you're onboarding your staff members, they're not refinding the problems that have been solved from the past. We are difference makers. We create legacies for kids. Life ready, education is the clearest indicator in life outcomes, employment indicator and attitudes and well-being. 
We run our career academies where the kids do the real work within the organization. At the high school level, the students run the store, the, store, the design academy does the designs. Our healthcare academy, the kids do our vision screening, our hearing screening, our cancer walks, the real work of the organization. Our design center, they solve a real world problem based on a need within the community. And our academy enrollment is trending up, but we're not there yet. Because 100% of the kids have to be ready for that life outcomes. That means 100% of all of our special education students have to be able to transition successfully post high school. We have 96% of the kids that are completed in their workforce planning. We are a top workplace. We are now nationally ranked. We are now a best place to live. We have gone from that to that because now we have a clear direction. South Louisiana Community College actually created indicators of increased retention from first semester to second semester. 100% time to degree completion, associate degree certifications, employment engagement retention, increased satisfaction of their employees and their students, and transfers to a four-year university they're measuring. All of those indicators are related to their levels of success. The CEO of Toyota said, we get brilliant results with our full team with brilliant processes at scale. Others get average or worse, res worse results with bright people who cannot see their broken systems. Change is hard. 70% of all change efforts fail. I've lived a career in education that I can tell you the, the topics that we talked about educationally in five-year increments from 1979 to 2019. And what stuck at scale was limited. Because as a profession, we are now just getting to the tipping point of how do you actually make systems improvements stick within our field. We need an army of problem solvers. And I, I applaud you for the work that you're doing because this is the work of our, of our improvement. In a typical system, we are typically unconsciously incompetent at 20 to 40% of what's required for us to be successful in the job. Think back at your first year of teaching. Were you at the 20% or 40%? of unconsciously incompetent. You didn't know what you didn't know, right? First year as a leader, you're unconsciously incompetent. The way systems can accelerate past that is by hardwiring what it takes to onboard people more successfully and open up that learning system within the organization so that 500 individuals don't have to learn the lessons independently by themselves as they improve. So when we talk about that learning journey, how do we accelerate this pathway from unconsciously incompetent to unconsciously competent and making it stick at scale? Part of the development of the system how do you actually establish your strategic priority and goals? Do a deep level of leader development. Create a set of always actions of how the system is going to improve and learn together. Make sure your performance management system creates those abilities to individually reflect and then support people at scale so that your improvement processes and your accelerators like your materials, like your technology, have a chance of actually improving results. 
When you look at an evidence-based leadership, you're going to see the arrow accelerate here. And the reason why, by research, this breaks apart is if these parts aren't there as the backbone, this can't take hold at the system level. So I affectionately say evidence-based leadership is the skeleton. It's the backbone. The core values are the heart. They're your true north. And the improvement processes are the circulatory system. It's actually how you make the, the system improve over time and continue to learn. Leadership is a behavior, not a title. And actually deploying the ability of pulling in that brain power of everyone within the organization helps the full system improve. You want to move from a team of all-stars working independently to, a, to an all-star team actually having the ability to learn with and from one another and transfer the knowledge generationally and transfer the knowledge across the system from what's being learned. I've learned a ton from the work of Studer Education and the healthcare industry. I've learned a ton from Jacka Malstrom, who is a writer out of, of Sweden, and the work of the Carnegie Foundation. I encourage you to use those as resources. Here are some other resources available for you as far as coming up. I know that we're limited on time, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, well, you had a leadership team at Menominee Falls that probably was not your own. That's correct. And I'm just curious how you announced yourself, how you told your co-leaders what your plan was. You know, how did it just get started? Yeah, and, and the just started as a team. So part of Part of the condition that we had with the board is we needed to just stop buying stuff for a while and invest in the brain power of the people. So as the leaders at Central Office were doing some deep learning around improvement methodology, we had the teachers starting to work with the cycles of improvement. You know, so it was happening at the same level. The feedback loop started with Central Office first. So rather than starting with the student feedback loop, we actually brought feedback from the staff into central office so that we could prove that we were committed to removing barriers for the people. So that was really the first step within the process. And you're right. Some of the team members, from a research standpoint, when you look at the continuum of behavior, about 35% of your people are, are moving in the direction. There's a big middle that are waiting to see it happen. And then there's about 6 to 8% who are consciously pulling on this other end of the rope because they're very disenfranchised. So you have to actually move the entire system. I know it's been a long day. I know that everyone is looking for their next steps to, for the evening. I attached some resources for you so that you've got some templates that you can use as resources in your work. So I appreciate the time and look forward to continuing the conversation. <laughs>